going deeper into this world of soil health and soil science and understanding more of what's going on with your plants and the soil itself and help create the new natural modern food system. Welcome back to another Nature's Always Right video. Today's video is going to be about the proper best broad forking technique as well as an explanation of what is no-till, what is tilling, what are the differences between them, when do we do each of them. We'll be talking a lot about soil health in general so I hope that you learn a lot of more details about how the soil structure is formed, how the different microorganisms work together, and some more chemistry involved in the soil conversion process. So first of all, what is tilling? Let's define what tilling is. So tilling is, you know, it's an actual machine called a tiller, and the way that this machine works is it has rotating spinning blades, and what those blades do is chop through the soil, completely blend it, completely turn over that soil. So it's chopping up all the larger insects, such as uh, earthworms, um, you know, roly polies, the mac macro micro arthropods. Um, then what it's also doing, it's breaking apart all the fungal strands. Tilling also is killing uh, just lots of different microscopic life as well. The other detrimental thing that tilling does is when you're tilling, you are breaking down long-term stored carbon. So in the soil, there's long-term stored carbon, and then there is the short-term carbon. So the short-term carbon that the microbes and soil life has access to would be like roots. That's a short-burning carbon. A long-burning carbon molecule is one that has been uh, surrounded by organic matter and is trapped inside of there um, and is locked away. If you've ever heard the term carbon sequestration, that's what they mean by that. So the different organic acids and all these different chemical processes that the microbes are doing uh, create the glue that holds together organic matter. So that is why tilling is so detrimental to the soil and all of the soil life, even the plants themselves, everything is relying on carbon, right? We are carbon-based life forms. And if we're releasing that carbon, it's supposed to be stored for hundreds or a thousand years under the ground. We're releasing that sooner. And that effect that that has is obviously some of that goes into the atmosphere. And then some of it, now it's able to be digested by the microbes. And now they're burning up all of this carbon in the soil that was supposed to be sticking around for a very long time. Another effect that tilling has is it'll cause you know, the microbes to feed on a bunch of nitrogen as well as carbon because they need the combination of both as they're feeding. So it causes a speed up of the microbes, they're infused with oxygen, they now have carbon unlocked that they, they can go eat. When they eat the carbon, now they want, now they also need more nitrogen. So this is kind of how the loss of topsoil happens. So when you're doing that over and over and over, that is how uh, a situation like the Dust Bowl happens. When you have drought for many years, the topsoil can no longer hold moisture because it doesn't have the organic matter with the long-term carbon in it. So then it blows away into the air and it's lost. So those are a few of the reasons uh, that make tilling so detrimental to soil. And there's also been soil tests done where they've analyzed the soil biology. They've done multiple different tests. So they've tested no-till organic, where they're not using any pesticides or herbicides, and they're not tilling. They also did um, tilling with no pesticides and herbicides. They also did the, the strict conventional, you know, poisons, and tilling and everything. The fourth one that they did, they tilled, but they didn't use any pesticides or herbicides. What they found is that tilling had a more damaging effect on the soil life than pesticides and herbicides did. And I think that's really fascinating. 
And part of the reason probably is because those pesticides and herbicides kind of persist on the top of the soil and they're not going deeper down in there. Whereas a tiller is tilling, you know, 12 to 14 inches, something like that. And it's rotating all of that soil. So it's bringing subsoil that was 12 inches down in a totally different sphere of the soil and bringing it up here. I just wanted to emphasize the fact that, you know, when we're tilling, we're bringing that lower subsoil and we're bringing it to the top. We're exposing all of that to massive amounts of oxygen and air and light if this, and when the sun's beating down on the soil. So that's the kind of definition and explanation of what's going on with tilling. So if you're not going to till, if we're going to go to a less disturbance model, what are those models? The next lower level of disturbance would be to use a broad fork. This is my Treadlight broad fork. I've got a whole review video all about this broad fork and how to set it up and use it and all the special features that make it unique. And I'll also be having another video coming out comparing the three best brands of broad forks as well. So a good aspect of tilling, the reason we do it, right? Um, we're trying to make the ground softer. We're trying to make it easier to plant in and to work with. We're also assuming that our soils are probably gonna be compacted and compacted soils have less oxygen in them. And healthy soil that grows food is aerobic, where it has high oxygen content. So the broad fork allows us to aerate the bed while minimally disturbing the ground. It also gives lift to the soil, which helps minimize compaction. So what you saw me do there with the broad fork, I just broke the ground and lifted slightly. This is the proper technique. You might see some people continuing to lift and lift and lift and lift, but if you keep lifting like that, what's happening? As I lift and lift and lift, see the subsoil here? This is now getting brought to the top. This, this chunk falls over. Now that's to the side. And now we're actually rotating. We're not, we're not getting the effect that we want. All we want when we're broad forking just to get a minimal break of the soil, lift it up, get some air in there to penetrate, and we stop. And you'll be able to see the lift. You see the little hump that made? So just that little bit of breakage gets a bunch of fresh air in there for the soil to help keep it aerobic, to keep those healthy aerobic microbes alive and help them to keep converting the soil and making it better for us. So something else I wanna mention, this huge chunk right here, none of this has been broken up or disturbed everything is intact so when we come back with a rake and all this closes up it's able to come back together and reform and heal very quickly people have asked me that question before but this little bit of disturbance is a good thing for the soil so the healthier that your soil gets the less that this is going to be required and if you saw the farm tour with jared of jared's real food who is a local farmer here in San Diego also, you'll notice that his beds that are about six to seven years old, he's not broad forking anymore because it's not necessary because the life under the soil has had enough time to convert everything and it's so deep down, his soil is so soft and loamy that he's just good to go. So I just want to emphasize the fact that a lot of these disturbance techniques are used more in the beginning of the soil creation and then as your soil structure improves, you should be backing off of that stuff uh, as quickly as you can. As you guys saw, when I built this market plot, I did till the ground, right? So there's a context for everything. There is no one solution, one right way. You also saw me at the new plot. You saw me pair garden beds completely without any machines at all, no tilling whatsoever. So there's different situations when you wanna do different things. And I think that tilling, especially for the first time when you're setting up your beds, makes absolute sense, especially when dealing with hard or compacted soils. Now, if you're in an area with more sandy soils, you might not need to use a tiller at all to get it started. I needed to do it so that I could get it going. Tilling one time, it's gonna be okay. The ground is gonna recover eventually. It's more important that you kind of get that ground unlocked. It's been compacted for who knows how long, maybe a decade. And infusing all that oxygen in, in there, waking up all the microbes, to me is not, you're killing some of it as well, but to me, 
it makes sense to to just get the ground kind of shook up. Hopefully you've got some compost that you've also tilled in um, as you're doing that. So then you're kind of inoculating some beneficials in there to, to help the process get going, get those populations of healthy microbes going. And then that's it. Then I, for me personally, I would never till after the first time. I then switch to Broad Fork and I'm now um, a year and a half to two years on most of these beds. And now it's pretty cool. I've watched my beds go from, you know, I could only get the broad fork in about this much. And now I can get the broad fork in all the way to the top bar. It's very smooth and very easy. So I'm getting to the point now where broad forking is starting to become not as necessary. It may even be something I do um, for, for specific crops that penetrate deeper into the ground like carrots or other root crops. I probably will continue to use the broad fork every time I prep the bed um, through the next year. I'll see how the soil structure goes and adjust as needed. So then there's another type of no-till or low-till type of gardening and farming and that's called no-dig. So Charles Dowding is probably the most famous for no-dig gardening. That and um, Back to Eden gardening. And those are the two most famous teachers for no-dig. And no-dig is awesome. Um, but no-dig doesn't really play into the market gardening context very well, in my opinion. For some crops, it, it may work out well doing no dig, but for what I'm doing, a lot of these quick turnover, greens, you know, 30 day vegetables, you gotta crop them, crop them out, replant, you know, there's not, I'm not doing so much transplants and things like that where no dig makes a, a bit more sense. There are some interesting things you can do where you could leave the old crop residue behind, put a bunch of compost over the top of that residue and then plant into that compost. I don't have enough compost available to me to be able to, to do that method, but I think that that's also a very interesting method in the market gardening context. Um, but let me explain no dig. So for no dig, you're not using a broad fork, although those people may do that sometimes if they need to break the ground a little bit. Uh, but in a no dig situation, you would harvest the beets or the lettuce, take them out, add some more compost, and then plant. That's it. There is no cultivating of the ground. So usually the back to Eden people, they're using mulch um, all the time. Yeah, no dig is really excellent. I, if you're a home gardener, I'd highly recommend it because the less soil disturbance, the better. But like I said, in the beginning of your soil development, it may not be as possible as you think to do no dig. But after a year of really good soil practices, using the broad fork, you can get to the point where you can convert it to no, no dig and you never have to use a tool like this again if you don't want to. I hope that explaining kind of these different models that people are using helps to kind of tie it all together for you and you can see that there's a lot of different ways to do this and it really matters the context that you're growing like are you growing for sale what are you growing for sale you know is this just for your home garden what's your soil structure like you know what's your weather like there's so many things that go into this i just want to recommend to people that you don't go hardcore i'm a back to eden purist or i'm a permaculturist period and i don't think any other way and that's that's a very dangerous way of thinking because you're gonna miss out on some really amazing ways to do things and it may be a much better way in the short term and in the long term depending on the scenario so just don't get too locked into any type of ideology whether it's farming or, or something else because almost all things in life aren't black and white and there's a lot of gray area a lot of um, variables that come into play so just keep your mind open think about what's going on, what you're trying to do, and, and then apply it to your context the best you can. Okay, so now let's focus on some broad forking technique. Let's say we've just lifted this section and now it's time to lift the fork out and move it back. So the, the easiest way to do this for the least amount of work, don't lift it up all the way out of the ground. What I'm trying to accomplish is just go back the same distance as the tines. So about 12 inches. So I'll let my tines glide backwards, sink in, and then I'll step on it. Stepping on it first makes it a lot easier to balance on. If you just 
set the fork here and then you try to jump up on it, whoa, kind of gets crazy. So step on it first so it's easy to balance on. And then, depending on your broad fork, you're gonna rock back and forth. Some broad forks allow you to wiggle side to side. The tread light broad fork works the best going forwards and backwards. So you can see how easily I just slid right in there. Now I'm gonna pull back and stop. Just getting that little bit of lift and I'm not going any further. If I was to continue, I'll just show you what will happen. You see how it breaks apart like that? Now what's ending up happening is it's having a more of a similar effect to tilling actually, breaking apart all that soil. But the thing that the broad fork never does, it's never compacting the ground. The thing about the tiller is that the rotational energy of those blades, it's actually, when the blades come down, it's actually compacting subsoil. And tillers um, are usually not 30 inches wide, so that heavy machine is now sitting on your bed also compacting the ground. And compaction in soil uh, can kind of cause dead zones where microbes and fungi can't live. Uh, it affects the way the water infiltrates through the ground as well. So if there's a compaction spot, the water will literally just go around it and not even give water to that area because there's not enough space for the water to fill. So once again, just lift, lift up, let it drag back, push it in, then just wiggle back and forth, done. Pull back, done. If you start seeing the ground start falling apart a bunch, just stop. Once you've got the lift, that's all you need. When I prep my beds, I lay out my new compost before I broad fork. And the reason I do it that way is so that when I'm broad forking and I lift the ground up, a little bit of that compost is gonna seep in there and inoculate lower sections of the soil add nutrients down in there that the microbes can start breaking down for me. And um, so that's why I do it that way. You could do it the other way around. You could broad fork and then you could do the compost last. That's fine too. Another thing I'll say, I know that some people, you'll see a lot of people online, they'll sh shove the broad fork into the ground like that. I've read that that actually can cause some compaction doing it that way. It kind of makes sense if you just throw this down to the ground, it stops, right? And it locks it. You know, maybe that's happening. But the main reason, I guess, to not shove it into the ground is that it's a lot more effort to do it that way. It's much easier to just barely pull it out, let it glide, and then just use your body weight the whole time. And you're just gonna, it's gonna be a lot less effort for you. And you're gonna save your body. I have found in certain scenarios with really hard dirt, this, it does make sense to kind of jam it in first and then step on it and then crank on it. But it, it really kind of depends on your soil structure. But in general, do the, this technique that I showed you using all body weight and it's much, much easier. And then as far as your handles go, I step off the fork, I pull it down to here so that I'm able to get my hands to the other side and then I'll push down and I'll use my body weight to do that and then to always be sure that when you're pulling down you're grabbing the tops of these bars this is going to give you the most leverage and strength if you're pulling from here it's not going to be as strong for you so I'll pull from the top you know I'm leaning back too I'm trying to use my body weight so I'm not using all of my muscles so I'll pull back get over the top of it Kind of let my body weight push down. Stop. Pull. Push. Stop. Yeah, that's a super good workout for you. So the next thing I'll mention is the width of the broad fork. Now, from my experience, I've tried out many different brands of broad forks. I've tried different sizes. And it's now my opinion that broad forks for a 30 inch bed should actually be smaller than 30 inches. This is a 24 inch wide broad fork. I noticed this after using my 30 inch broad fork for a long time that when it's a full 30 inches and you pull it back, the ground actually breaks about two inches from the side of the furthest tine. So as you can see here, that's where the tine is, but look where the ground's broken. It's broken all along here. 
So it, you're actually getting lift a bit outside of there. So on a 30 inch broad fork, I was actually getting lift in my compacted pathways. And what that does is put more stress on the tool and more stress on me because it's going to be more effort to lift compacted ground. In my next video, I'm going to compare the three best brands of broad forks and that should help you make a better decision on which one you want to buy. But I want to explain the fact that I, I really think that less than 30 inches is ideal. And in, in my opinion, 24 to about 27 inches is what you're looking for. And that would be excellent for a 30 inch bed. So here's another tip on broad forking if you get stuck. Sometimes you'll hit a rock on one side, one side will be drier than the other side or harder than the other side for whatever reason. So if that happens to you, and let's just say, let's say the right side is going down a lot easier. You're going, you're, you're standing on it really balanced, but the right side is sinking in way faster. What you should do, move all your weight to the side that's having an issue and then wiggle back and forth. And then do you see how it balanced itself out really quickly like that? That's all you gotta do. Now let's say you hit a rock and that little trick I just showed you is not working. You're not sinking down deeper still. Then what you might need to do, so if you picture the rock is here, hopefully it's a smaller rock than this, but my fingers are the tines. So you keep trying to push down the rocks in the way, right? So what you can try to do is rock the handles much further so that the tines will kind of scoop and go under it. So that kind of looks like this. So I would just rock it way more forward way more back you can even stand off of the broad fork and really rock it and that almost all the time gets me around the rock and if you still can't get it around the rock then just lift the broad fork up go back or forward a couple inches and you'll probably miss it and then after you broad fork if you're not going to prep and plant your bed right away don't leave the holes exposed from the broad forking just come with a rake and rake back and forth one time to fill in all those holes because those holes you know as sunlight and air is able to hit that it's killing biology so get that subsoil covered as soon as possible after broad forking and here's another tip on broad forking to make it easier on yourself in the summer when the ground is a lot drier or if you live in a dry climate where there's no rain for many months the ground is going to get dry the subsoil is going to get dry and then it makes it really hard to broad fork. So something I like to do before I prep my beds, I'll run my drip lines for like 30 minutes to an hour, depending on how dry they are, to soak the bed. So I do this after I've removed the previous crop, then I'll come in and broad fork it. Wet ground is so much easier to broad fork on. So keep that in mind also, if you're working with dry ground, it's just, and it feels kind of impossible. Usually when heavy clay soil, when that gets dry, it's super hard, almost like concrete. Okay, let's talk healthy soil here. What does healthy soil even look like? I've gotten a soil test done on my soil after I've developed it for a while, and my soil is excellent. My soil organic matter is at 5% now. All my nutrients are high. My water inf infiltration's high. The soil scientist described my soil as loam, which this was not loam to begin with, it was clay. So what you're looking for in good soil, now you see when I'm breaking this apart, you'll kind of see these small, little, smaller little balls kind of fall off. And this is called soil aggregates. So the microorganisms and the fungi, they create this glue that's actually um, pulling together uh, the sand, silt, and clay, the organic matter, and forming it together. So you, when you're seeing soil break apart like this, there's not some random big chunk of clay. Um, it's, you're, you're noticing it's very consistent, right? There's not different layers of soil. It's, it's now become sort of one layer, and it's all this same really nice soil aggregate. So soil like this, the water can infiltrate really well. Um, plants' roots have more availability of nutrients and oxygen. So I hope this helps you kind of see what some healthy soil looks like and acts like. And you're noticing also that it's, it's holding moisture super well. Like I can almost fold this into a little ball. So it's full of moisture, but it's not dripping wet. So there's still oxygen in this and it's staying aerobic. Even though it rained recently and this ground is super soaked. 
Okay, let's go take a look at some dirt that hasn't been touched in a very long time. So we can have some comparison. We're in my neighbor's yard right now. This is an area that I walk around in a lot. This is an area that's never had good soil or garden soil. It's just had grass and weeds growing here for many years. Okay, so here's that soil lifted up. Here's kind of the first six to eight inches of it. And if we look, we can see the grass. You can see more towards the top here. It's almost more blacker dirt. You can see like kind of the different layers of soil here. This I can tell has more clay in it. This is a actual ball of clay. And if you look inside, it's clay. So this soil is not too bad. So this is pretty similar to the soil that I started with. You know, I'm finding, you just find huge chunks of clay in there. So here's a piece of my market garden soil. So if you see mine, let's kind of break it. If I just squeeze it a little, really falls apart, really breaks apart into little fine particles very easily. Or if I take a chunk off this one, it's got good root structure, it's doing good. This is pretty healthy soil actually over here. When I go to squeeze it and break it apart, much more clay content in here. It's holding together much more strongly. Things aren't breaking apart into those finer particles as much. There's some more clay. See how it falls apart in these bigger chunks. Anyways, just trying to show you kind of some differences, but it's cool to see that my soil has changed quite a bit. I no longer find these giant chunks of clay anymore. My soil color is really nice now. The soil structure itself is no longer stratified really. It's kind of all one big chunk of really good soil structure. All right, so that's gonna be it for today's video on no-till, the proper broad forking technique, lots of tips, and lots of soil health discussion in there as well. Really hope it helped you guys out. Please leave any comments that you have in the description. I'd love to answer any questions that you guys have or clarify something for you. If you're interested in going deeper into this world of soil health and soil science and kind of under, understanding more of the details of what's going on with your plants and the soil itself, I highly recommend watching some different talks by Elaine Ingham. She's a very famous soil scientist. Uh, also Gabe Brown is another great no-till uh, soil health farmer. You know, check out those two people and you'll kind of go into a whole world of soil science. Oh, and uh, Jeff Lowenfels as well is amazing. Please be sure to like this video and share it with anybody you think would benefit. Please be sure to check my Patreon page out if you'd like to support the channel, or you can make a donation through PayPal. All the money I receive goes back into my video and education for you guys, so um, Everything's designed to feed back into itself and make it better and better and better so I can keep producing really good content for you guys. This takes hundreds, thousands of hours to put these videos together and I'm not really paid much for that. I get hardly anything from YouTube. So every little bit helps keeping me making these videos. If I take three or four hours to, you know, making and editing videos, that's time I can't spend on my farm growing vegetables, which I could then sell to support my family. So trying to do a, a balancing act right now of making my content and farming at the same time. So thank you to everyone who has uh, donated and helped support me in my mission of teaching as many people to farm and garden as possible and help create the new natural modern food system. All right, everybody, thank you so much for watching. I hope you learned a lot about soil science in this episode. I love it. I, I'm obsessed with it, and I hope that you will become as well. All right, guys, see you in the next one. Bye.